Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, Sustainable Models for the Use of Technology and in Instruction. Um, our speakers today, we have John Cheslock, Bart Purcell, Fred Loomis, and Chris Stubbs. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Great. Uh, thanks, Lisa. I wanted to do just kind of a, a brief introduction about this project and some of the things we've been working on here as part of a, a TLT fellowship that began with John uh, at the beginning of the summer. We probably had a conversation about this time last year and like many conversations with John, I think it was scheduled for 30 minutes and we went an hour, hour and a half and both furiously writing notes down about uh, some of the John's interests and the things he studies along with some of the things we were looking at uh, from the TLT perspective. So I don't think there's any question we're at a really interesting time in higher education right now. We're involved with MOOCs, we're involved with badges, this big data and learning analytics uh, movement's really taking off. So as we kind of sit around and think about these kind of things, we thought, who can we partner with to do this? What sort of folks around Penn State kind of can help us think about this kind of stuff? And that's how we stumbled onto John and the Center for the Study of Higher Education, where a lot of what John does along with the folks he works with is think about uh, how do all these different technologies kind of impact Penn State, not just from a faculty standpoint and a teaching standpoint and a learning standpoint, but how will this impact kind of uh, Penn State as an enterprise, as an organization. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today, and with that I'll hand it over to John. Okay. Well, I'm going to stand up because I like to move. That's <laughs> fine with everyone here. Um, so real quick, just some context with uh, which Bart talked about is that Penn State's a unique institution in that in the 1950s, it uh, created a program on training people to work in administration in higher education, one of the first universities to do that. And in 1969, it created the Center for the Study of Higher Education, a research center pertaining to that. And it's a really interesting thing to work in this area because I'm constantly in the field as a researcher because my field is college and universities campuses. Every administrative meeting that I attend happens to just be a fascinating data rich environment for me. And so it makes it sort of a, a, a fun thing to study. Um, the, uh, so what, what that means then is that when we think about how to proceed as a uh, academic program, as a research center, you know, there's a little bit of thought that maybe we should be thoughtful in how we do this because we think a lot about this. Uh, this is, this is uh, stuff that we think about in research and uh, so could we apply some of that research to the work that we do? And um, the research that I, you know, there's a, within the Center for the Study of Higher Education, there's a variety of different uh, uh, research areas that uh, folks focus on, uh, issues pertaining to student access, issue pertaining to faculty, a lot of this stuff very relevant to the use of technology and instruction. I study one thing, uh, the financial sustainability of colleges and universities. So I'm, it's always useful to have one person in the room with my research interest, but not more than one person, right? Because you, we're not really focused on finances here, but everything we do has a financial component to it. And so that's what I do. So I'm going to uh, set up things a little bit from my perspective uh, in terms of how the use of technology and instruction can alter sort of the economic situation that college and universities face. And the context in which I present this is that um, college and universities are facing really serious financial challenges. If you, if you look at the trends in government funding uh, for higher education, if you look at the trends in net tuition revenue for students, uh, neither of them are positive. And for most institutions, there's not other revenue sources to easily turn to. A school like Penn State has more options than uh, other universities, but not as much probably as them. And so I'm going to talk about how technology alters the financial situation of colleges and universities. And first of all, I'll talk about the four ways that it can affect sort of instructional costs. It can act as a complement to personnel. It can be an unbundler of personnel. It can be a way to outsource personnel. It can be a way to replace personnel. And we'll also talk about how technology can affect the revenues of a college and university. Uh, first of all, it creates increased opportunities for scale that were not there previously. It creates new revenue opportunities that weren't even there at all. And it's also a threat to existing revenue sources, right? And along the way, we'll also talk about, every time we talk about finances, we'll also talk about the effect on faculty, their work, the possible effect on, on student learning and that sort of thing. And so that's how we'll proceed. So let's now talk about this idea of complement, which is how we usually think of these things, right? If you go into any classroom within a college or university, 
uh, now versus 30 to 40 to 50 years ago, right, you will see the same setup with more machines, right? Instead of it, you don't just have a blackboard, you have a blackboard plus machines. Just like when you go into a, a doctor's office, there's the same personnel, but more machines with that personnel, right? And there are also personnel who help the instructors use those machines or personnel who help make sure those machines are effective, right? And this is incredibly good news for student learning, right? There are tons of different ways that we figured out how students can have a better education through how uh, this use, through the use of technology. Now the flip side is we're really good at thinking about quality in higher ed. Usually our ideas cost a lot more, which uh, uh, is kind of a downer to talk about. I'm usually a really unfun person to be around. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you chose to share time with me this morning because uh, most people like the free lunch speakers. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of always, there's, there's no free lunch speaker. Um, but, uh, but that's sort of the challenge, which it is, it's, it, it doesn't help with issues pertaining to student debt and thinking about all the other things college universities can do with, with funding, but it improves quality. And there's all sorts of just great things that have happened in that regard. And this is what most people are interested in, but this isn't as interesting to me. Uh, what's interesting to me are the other ways that these are changing, uh, even though I actually kind of like this the most. I like it when people just get, come to me and write me a blank check and I just focus on quality. That's the most fun I have in my day on a personal level. So let's think about the unbundler thing, right? And if we think 30, 40, 50 years ago, we think of the idea of I'm a faculty member, I teach a course, I develop the course, develop the material for the course, I deliver the course, and then I assess the course, assess the students on that material, right? I do all three things, all three things are bundled up and reside in me, the faculty member, right? Which, uh, you know, technology has, you know, often leads us to unbundle a little bit because that development part, especially if we're thinking about online education or just uh, residential blended sort of things that require a lot of technological investment up front, there's a lot of initial cost to delivery, right? It, it costs a lot. You cannot invest the amount that's required to, you know, develop that core. I'm sorry, not there's not a lot of cost in delivery, there's a lot of cost in development. It costs a lot of money to develop these courses. You can't develop each one individually. Uh, like, like you did in the past, that there's gonna be a really heavy investment, right? And so what ends up happening a lot of times is the development gets separated from delivery and assessment, right? I am developing a World Campus course right now. I will teach it in spring 2015, but another person will teach it in fall 2014, right? And that's often uh, how it's done because it would be pretty much impossible for the instructional designer, all the, the sport personnel to work with the fall 2014 instructor and then work again with me in spring of 2015. That would uh, not sort of uh, be an uh, option. So you separate development from delivery and assessment. And so the initial development cost grows, right? If I teach without technology, um, I still have to develop the syllabus, I still have to think about the readings, I still have to think about what we're gonna do in class, but it's just me and my time, right? If I'm uh, developing with technology, we also, to the extent to which there's technology costs, but there's also per other personnel I'll work with, so it's more expensive to do that. And so those initial development costs grow and it only sort of, uh, uh, it's, it's offset only if scale happens. If this then happens and is delivered a large number of times. That's sort of why there's this logic towards scale a lot of times in, uh, online, you know, in online education or other uh, courses that use a lot of technology, right? And this changes the nature and structure of faculty work. This idea that I'm going to teach some course that someone else developed, uh, that's very different than what uh, traditional faculty roles have been. And so this is a, a change in how the work is. And then what is the effect on student learning and that sort of thing? Uh, the answer would be it depends because this can, things can be unbundled in 10 zillion different ways. Uh, that would be the interesting thing. So then you have also the idea of outsource a little bit, which just says the exact same thing I said about not bundling, but the different work activity can happen in different organizations, right? And so it could be that other organizations conduct portions of instruction or instructional support, right? It's not just all produced within one organization, but it spans organizations, right? And that's what we see more and more and you partner with the organizations who can do work better or less expensively and Sometimes it's done by using course materials freely or at very low cost. And so you, you hear cases of, of I think, um, uh, 
you know, uh, San Jose State, I think, was one of the news where they talked about, well, let's use the material that are freely provided associated with MOOCs, and that will be the, a big part of the course development, right? And so this is a very different uh, approach again, with again, very major changes to the nature and structure of faculty work, because now you're, you have people working out in different organizations. It's, it's unbundled across organizations. And finally, the, the final one is replacement, right? And so if you think about replacement, let's just think about how cars are made now versus 40 years ago. Go into a car factory. There's a lot less humans there. There's a lot more machines, right? Uh, think about a lot of things that are done now with less humans involved. And that's, there's you know, labor economists who study this say, this has major implications for society. One reason why the labor structure is changing in with society, right? Is that uh, this sort of uh, techn technology which is produced by highly skilled individuals, which then means there's less uh, employment needs for less skilled individuals and those sort of things. That's this fundamental change that's happening throughout society, but it hasn't really changed happened in education. And there's this fundamental question is, are we a, the nature of education is that it's personnel intensive, right? That's just the nature of the work that we do. And uh, adaptive learning is a case where could there be this personalized interaction where there's less humans involved, but the machines are really personalizing it for the individuals? Um, these have giant upfront costs associated with it. You know, you just live, you, just to do this at the level of really quality, similar quality or higher quality is incredibly expensive undertaking. Can this really happen? Can each college and university create their own adaptive learning system at the level of quality that's possible? Probably not, but then college and universities don't work together. How does that happen? Just fascinating stuff at that level. And you know, fascinating implications for student learning because there's all sorts of potential in this domain to really think about how uh, you could personalize learning in ways that's much harder if it's just humans delivering it. Um, but you have to have humans coming up with really uh, uh, fancy coding to figure out how to personalize in that regard. And obviously implications for faculty work. And this is one of the, the most frustrating things to study sort of uh, industry like higher education is we're human services industry, right? So machines lowering costs usually means less humans. And I like working with humans. I don't want to see any of them go. And, I, and, and it also sometimes means less paid human highly paid humans, and I like the people I work with, I want them to be paid a lot. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing, but I also don't want students to have to take on so much debt. So I want both of those, right? I want both of those. I want my free lunch very much. All right, so I talked about the cost side, right? And at the same time, I talked about the student learning side. I also talked about the nature of faculty work side, right? What about the revenue side, right? And we already sort of see the revenue. The first idea is it allows for scale, right? The logic of higher education was very much, we build physical campuses that serve people who can physically transport themselves to those campuses at the times we designate for those classes, right? And that's why we have tons and tons and tons of colleges and universities, because especially when, when most colleges and universities were founded, it was really hard to get around, right? Most people attended local colleges and universities, and that's why they're spread all around, and they're primarily located in places where lots of people used to live, as opposed to as much where they live now. Coming from the state of Arizona, with the small number of schools there, it's, it's very eye-opening in that regard. So what happens now is technology, right? If you think about the online learning context, now uh, no longer restricts uh, a school to, to students who can physically transport themselves to their campus during the times at which classes can be offered. This could be completely at a distance. This could be blended, where folks don't have to come in as often, so you don't have to worry about matching up the timing with people who have busy lives and busy other things. I can mean that, but it allows for a particular institution to enroll a much larger number of students. And so I'm doing work right now. iPads has just released for the first time data on the amount of students who take online classes and the concentration, right, of students at a small number of schools in terms of online classes is very different than residential. It's a much more concentrated industry, if you think of it that way, uh, than it is residentially, which has huge impacts for the number of schools that exist uh, there. So it's a huge opportunity for some schools who can scale, but those other schools that don't scale are at a huge disadvantage. So it creates a little bit more competition across colleges and universities. And then there's also these other new revenue models, which is this idea that um, we are going to provide education 
maybe for free. We're not going to give official designations, official credits to you if you complete this education. Uh, but we'll just have a lot of people just come there, just like they went to Facebook and Twitter. And if you get enough people who go there, Facebook and Twitter figured out a way to, to generate revenue from it. And the people who invested in Coursera and other entities thought that maybe there would be some revenue associated with it. So maybe there's some revenue. And maybe some of that will come to those college and universities that engage in that. Right? An interesting question. Badges, this idea of, well, we're not just going to think about three credit chunks. We're going to talk about, I always talk with Chris, 0 0.21 credit chunks, or Kyle, 0 0.06 credit chunks, or something. Does it always have to be in three credit or one credit chunks? What would that look like? And would there ever be revenue associated with it? Could college universities not just sell three credit chunks, but sell short things? Would there be revenue? Um, and so, but, but before I go this, right, all this is talking about how universities all the opportunities are for it. But there's also this idea of disruption, right? And right, my, my favorite quote of all time is Sebastian Thrun, who said, in, uh, within uh, 50 years, there will only be 10 universities worldwide remaining on the planet, which I think he's retracted since that initial statement. Um, but you know, there's more sober voices who have um, uh, talked about you know, a large number of college universities, perhaps, uh, you know, having trouble just sustaining themselves, and you'd have a massive contraction of the number of college and universities in the U.S., right? And, you know, a lot of times they talk about it just new entrants coming in and diverting students because there are new entrants coming within that. And if you think about the Gates Foundation and you think about the federal government, they certainly are encouraging lots of new organizations to enter, right? And if those new organizations enter and grow, the other organizations probably contract, con you know, uh, shrink and, you know, sustainability is there. So that's sort of the nature thing. The thing that I'm always fascinated about is the following uh, scenario, which is, um, so the newspaper industry, what happened to the newspaper industry? Newspaper industry was a business where classified ads subsidized uh, news. And news collected the eyeballs so that people would come there so that you could be the place where you sell classified ads, which worked really well until Craigslist happened, right? And then, You'd, they didn't, there was another place for the eyeballs. And Craigslist didn't have to charge you much money because they didn't have to subsidize this news business. Right? So, and, and newspapers are diminished organizations. I don't, I, I don't know how this plays out, but for me the fascinating thing is I like to think of large residential lectures as the classified ads of higher education. Right? Cla large lectures subsidize smaller classes and extracurricular activities. Smaller classes and extracurricular activities attract students to a campus or university. Right? And, and when they come there, they need to take these large lectures, lectures as part of it. Now, sometimes we can create the large lectures as these tremendous learning opportunities. Not all college and universities have been able to do that effectively. But what's really interesting to me is, right, when an American Council of Education endorses specific MOOCs for credit, and there's these ideas that MOOCs could be um, um, you know, taken for credit, or my favorite interesting one is straighter line. Right? If you go to their website, they talk about, you can save $15,000 from taking your general education courses from us. Right? This idea of, you know, take these for small amounts of money, that's a logic. Now, Straighter Line does not have a large number of universities partnering with them, but, you know, students, if they vote with their feet, uh, could put pressure on college universities to allow these students to take most of their general education courses at very low prices, which would then displace those large lectures in the same way that classified ads were displaced. And so, that's that thing as well. So this is the sort of stuff I think about and write about and do it. And I do it a lot of times on finances. Other people focus on student learning, focus on the implications of faculty work. I find it just a fascinating moment to be involved in higher education and how technology can affect instruction, can have just huge impacts on most everything in higher ed. And so that's why it's such a fascinating area. So I also, you know, I'm part of an academic program. We are uh, thinking about how we can better serve society, how we can um, meet the desires of Penn State to really provide high quality education, to grow enrollments. And so in those regards, uh, we, have, we have things about higher ed. And so one thing we're thinking about, A, is world campus programs, B, our residential programs, uh, C, the service that we provide, professional development, uh, leadership academies, training institutes, uh, all of those things. And how can we think about them all together with technology as part of that. That's something that we, we think about a bit. Uh, so first of all, we just talked about is scale is an opportunity. So for us, higher administration, 
Um, most hired administration programs, they have large numbers of students from nearby community colleges and four-year institutions. I don't know if you've taken a tour of the higher education organizations nearby State College. There is not a large number of them, right? Uh, University of Pennsylvania, University of Southern California, you know, my colleagues at those other institutions, right, the Philly area, the Los Angeles area, there's a large number of college universities nearby. This is a natural place, right, for us to be sort of a leader in this regard, right? And so we have an increased pool of students, right, if you think about it in that regard. Uh, now all of a sudden you are not restricted to people who can physically transport themselves here. And then you also have an increased pool of faculty. So if we teach more specialized courses such as advising, such as enrollment management. Uh, sometimes we don't have the expertise uh, here and so we work to look to leaders in the field. It, Penn State has tons of leaders in these fields. Uh, and uh, so a lot of times we work with folks at Penn State, but this also provides the opportunity that if we teach a course on uh, faculty workload, compensation, and performance, the leading place for that is Delaware, which has the in Delaware instructional study of faculty uh, productivity. And, um, you know, we partner with the director of inst institutional research there to help develop and teach that course. It provides this thing. And the other thing that's really there is that there's a real competitive advantage at Penn State, right? We have this existing higher ed program, existing faculty, and then we also have the world campus infrastructure and reputation. And when I talk to my colleagues at other universities that try to develop sort of programs without sort of the access to world campus, it's just night and day the opportunities that are present here at Penn State versus then at some of the other places. So, you know, there's also this idea that scale produces financial benefits at the university, college, and local levels, right? That's certainly a portion of it. People understand the financial machinery of Penn State. They understand the role that that plays. And this is the thing that's fascinating to me as a faculty member a little bit, right? Because what's one of the biggest downers of being a faculty member is that you, 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 you go off and you, you be a faculty member and you're just really excited to do really, 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 really well in the classroom. You, want to do, you just want to do really, really well. And then you do it and then you realize that sometimes doing really, really well in a residential classroom, no one really cares when it comes to evaluation time sometimes. Not here at Penn State, this is just other universities <laughs> where I worked at before. Here it's not true at all. Uh, but sometimes that's it. Now, it's not not valued, it's just not, you know, it's sometimes that's not the case, right? And this idea that, well, part of it is, part of the logic just basically is, is that if I teach really, really well, what changes? Do more people come to Penn State just because John Cheslock teaches really, really well? Do more students say, I'm going to now physically transport myself to University Park because Cheslock has an amazing class, right? I don't know if they do. Right? I think they come and then they find out it's there and they're like, that's great. I'm getting this great thing. But how much does it draw on based on that, right? Part of the issues is rankings are developed based on research a lot of times, other things, right? But if students are attracted to institutional quality, right? Scale means one efforts towards in ensuring instructional quality could be valued, right? Because there is a premium on thinking about how we grow in particular ways as these things change. And that thinks about, hey, if I really invest in quality here, that's going to be something that's really recognized, right? When I develop that World Campus course, if I make that so good and we can communicate to people how good that is, that's there. If I have this blended opportunity, if I have this leadership institute and we can sort of do this out and get more people here, that's sort of a fascinating thing. And the interesting thing about it is online education creates greater competition, which increases the power of the consumer, right? When you have the ability to choose as a student, you have more power, and organizations need to be more responsive to it. And so it's the, the really qu interesting question is that if part right there, right? What motivates students when they choose, right? If I go to ratemyprofessor.com, I get kind of depressed, right, <laughs> about how they're going to choose. Uh, when, I talk, when they seem to share what they talk about how they, in, in terms of what they choose for individual classes, but I'm not sure that represents all students by any means. And so that's the fascinating thing is what do students choose based on? Right? What motivates them and how much is this idea of quality part of that? So that's the thing about this integration because what I was just talking about was these world campus initiatives. And at the same time we're doing this, the higher ed program has a residential one-year master's program, a two-year MS program primarily on partnership with student affairs. We also have doctor education. Like, what's all the ways we're doing thinking about this? Now, we do have a challenge a little bit is that, I don't know if you know this, but the College of Education is not where all the money resides. All right, so people have thought that and just thought the business school, um, the engineering, right, those are the poor stepsisters to the College of Education. That's actually a, a, a false, okay? I just want to tell you that, okay? Um, but, right, so what we don't have is the sort of just infrastructure 
that exists to sort of support in the way some of the e-institutes and other things that other sort of colleges have. And so we have to be really smart in thinking about it. Now, first of all, we have central resources like TLT, which is just a tremendous resource. Uh, one, it just being able to tap into that expertise uh, is something that you know, can happen throughout campus. And there's also then this idea of uh, you know, how do we also tap into that? And also, how do we also tap into uh, the stuff that we're doing with World Campus when we think about residential, right? Uh, so how do we repurpose materials? How do we be, if we're not loaded, okay, if we're not loaded, how do we be really efficient with what the resources we have, right? That's what you have to figure out how to do, right? So first of all, this idea of how do you repurpose materials? So if I'm, we're creating things, if we're simultaneously developing residential and online classes, how could we think about that in a really smart way, right? And could there be win-wins where everything ends up being better? if we think about those at the same time. That's what we've sort of tried to, to think through a bit. And first of all, this idea of, well, let's think about how the win on the online side and the win on the residential side. The win on the online side is, you know, sometimes faculty are more, into, they'll get more excited about flipping the classroom than developing an online course. It's, that's, I, I, with some faculty, I see that's the case. Then you say, well, when you're, right, we don't have, we don't have resources right now to help you develop materials that would aid in flipping the classroom, but we have instructional design support right now that's helping us develop these online classes. Why don't, when we're working with these folks in World Campus, and the World Campus folks have been tremendous in sort of thinking about how to do this well, how do we uh, sort of develop these, uh, how do we think about both at the same time? And when we're developing it for World Campus, we're also thinking about how to use it in the residential classroom, right? And then also, uh, this is gonna provide all that space and time uh, to think about our residential classwork in a way that we wouldn't otherwise, right? This requires time, it requires communication, um, but it's, it's, it ends up uh, really creating some opportunities. So that's one thing we've really thought a lot about. And then also, you know, how do we think about internal and external professional development, right? You know, there are professional development activities that happen at Penn State. They are uh, unrelated to credit, they happen, they happen in certain offices. We do professional development regarding working at a school like Penn State, we do it for credits. We do these separately. Wouldn't we think about doing them the same? Couldn't portions of courses be badges? Um, you know, wouldn't that make a lot of sense? That's something we've thought about in that regard. And that can sort of incentivize uh, affiliate adjunct faculty who like to repurpose materials locally. You're I'm not just benefiting me, I'm benefiting my entire professional field at my university, right? And also, could you partnership with professional associations, news sources, employment sites, you know? Uh, now you're talking about benefiting the, the larger field, and then all of a sudden we get to this idea of eyeballs again, right? Th those are the places where service and marketing, right? You provide the service, give away stuff for free, and then it also has this marketing component to it in that when you give stuff away for free, people say, this is really good, how could I get more, sort of thing, right? So anyway, that's a lot of just the background to how I think about some of these things. Um, and then also the idea of, well, how do we think about, um, how could we just improve the work that we do in the higher ed program? And maybe I'll turn to the MOOC and badge context, let Bart and Chris talk a bit, because the interesting thing about all this is when you're talking about a world campus program, you're talking about a residential program, you're talking about MOOCs, you're talking about badges, the same underlying principles are there. It's just a different challenge, so it, it's nice to talk about those, so. Can everybody hear me okay if I stay over on this side of the room? Yeah. So, contrary to popular opinion, uh, we did have some reasons to get involved with MOOCs, uh, and one of those reasons was to try and figure out how these might impact Penn State uh, University from what kind of is our core business model, right? Kind of research and, and pedagogy and learning. So how can we try and use MOOCs to make an impact in our world canvas, to make an impact in our resident courses, and so on. So that's one of the reasons we really tried to get involved in MOOCs. And one of the things we're thinking hard about now is how do we get into these courses we have and figure out new and interesting ways to repurpose some of this content. So to give you some examples, uh, the folks that did the epidemics course, they're right now trying to figure out of all the content they produce as part of their MOOC, how does that map to their existing infrastructure, their existing course sequences and majors? So all of the effort and energy they put into this, they're hoping to kind of come back into the student, uh, student body, both here at UP as well as online, and kind of repurpose a lot of these materials in different ways. 
the creativity folks are doing the same thing. They're trying to figure out how can they take some of that creativity content from the MOOC, and they're trying to focus that on kind of uh, first year engagement efforts and freshman seminar efforts to try and embed kind of this layer of creativity and creative thinking kind of across that whole curriculum. So that's one of the things we're thinking about with the MOOCs, along with some other things as well uh, that we'll get into a little bit later. So we're also thinking, like John said, in terms of service and marketing, right? So we are in the land grant public institution are providing these things of service to the community. So how many people here have taken a MOOC, enrolled in a MOOC? Show of hands. How many people finished? Keep your hands up if you finished. How many people got something valuable out of a MOOC? Right? So we hear a lot about completion percentages, which anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, it usually paints a gloomy picture. But we don't really like to talk about that. We like to talk about the good service we're doing in terms of people getting successful experiences, people pulling something valuable out of a MOOC. You know, I've never finished one, but I have pulled a heck of a lot of valuable things out of these MOOCs that I can apply in my everyday job to help me solve problems, to help, help me do my work better. So there's this idea of service, and some folks are even looking at grants that have kind of a, a, public, uh, a public piece, a public sharing piece. How can MOOCs serve in those regards too? So if NSF hands a research center a large pot of money to undertake some big study that has some sort of uh, publicity or output to the community, maybe a MOOC can serve that as well. So that's another area we're investigating. And also marketing. Uh, you can see just by our numbers, I think the creativity course was our biggest with about 98,000 active students. So almost 100,000 people actually stepped into that course and did something in the course. Uh, that's insane when you think about that from a marketing perspective, just having all those eyeballs from all around the world. There are almost 200,000, or uh, there are almost 200 countries and territories represented from the students that enrolled in that course. The MAPS course, uh, Anthony Robinson's course, he talks a lot about not necessarily the students that took his course and stepped into a paying certificate program at Penn State's whole campus, but he talks about the unique visitors to his program's website. So he had a 400% increase in unique visitors after he did his MOOC. And he says, you know, if you went out and spent that money on an advertising company, they probably couldn't get you those results. So just in terms of marketing, I think there's some incredible value here that we get out of embarking in some of these. And this we're still trying to figure out, right? I think everybody's trying to figure this out. So how do we get new forms of revenue out of these spaces? You know, there's a, a signature track now in Coursera that we're currently partnered with that we get a small slice of the student enrollments in that signature track. Uh, we're still trying to figure out, can we repurpose this in some other way that would bring in money in other avenues? And I think that's uh, something we're still gonna be looking at for a long time. And luckily, places like Coursera and these other companies that have venture capitalists that have invested in them, uh, they're really thinking about this. And they're gonna help us kind of move that forward and think about how we can kind of generate some revenues from these environments. So I'm gonna flip it over to Chris now to talk a little bit about badges. Okay, I won't go anywhere because I'm landlocked and that always gets fun and complicated. So, um, you know, I think that one of the big things that, that John was alluding to earlier, and, and for those who may not be familiar, right, there's this new goal from World Campus to grow our enrollments up to 45,000 in the next couple of years. You know, that's a pretty substantial undertaking. And I think what that involves is a lot of rephrasing the way that we put our product out to the marketplace. Uh, and so John alluded to some of these examples, right, of, of well, what if we unbundle some of our courses? What if we provide more op op opportunities for professional development, internal and external people? I think this is really where badges can be an area that, that move Penn State forward. You know, we are all aware of the cost of higher education, how expensive it is. I think if we can look at, at the content that we're able to put out and, and how can we share that with people in smaller pieces that are maybe more affordable, affordable that are maybe easier to digest in small periods of time, that cost a lot less money, uh, it creates new opportunities to bring people in in non-traditional ways. MOOCs being one example of that. Maybe that is a gateway toward a course concentration. It's not quite a major, uh, not quite a minor, not quite an associate's degree. Maybe it's something new. I think badges also get into to measuring what people already know and how they can bring that to the table to shorten the amount of time that they need to be here uh, during, a, during an educational experience, whether or not it's just sort of a certificate-like program or a, a four-year degree. I think there's a lot of things that we can do to sort of make it easier for people uh, to come in and, and join uh, the, the Penn State brand and, and help our own mission in the process. Um, you know, again, the idea of, of service and marketing, I think badges are a very public uh, sort of display to the outside world, right? It is a brand that you put on yourself. Um, 
And I think but by encouraging people to, to showcase what they know in these small little chunks that are very visible to others, again, it helps to extend the brand that we're trying to articulate to people. We, nobody walks around with a transcript uh, that they sort of hold, but you know, a badge might be something that might show up on more and more uh, informal uh, LinkedIn profiles or something like that, and again, just sort of extends the idea of what we're trying to pursue. Um, the revenue piece of it is an interesting one. And, uh, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to definitely check out Kyle, Kyle Peck's talk later on today, because uh, he's got some great ideas here. But what I will say about this is, again, the smaller we can make the offerings that we provide to people, I think the more opportunity there is to uh, encourage our own enrollments, to get more people in the door, uh, to give them a chance to experience John's great teaching, even if they didn't know that's why they came. Uh, because you know, a degree can be daunting, a degree can be expensive. Something smaller than that I think could be a lot more interesting. And a chance to repurpose material that we already have to people who may not be looking for the traditional four-year degree or maybe looking for paths to shorten it uh, or make it less expensive. So uh, just sort of, I guess, a teaser <coughs> on the badges topic there. And I'm Lucas okay. Red. All right. Chris, thanks so much. I'm clearly the oldest person on this panel, so I will remain seated too. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Lessons learned and relearned, and I think the lesson learned from the badges is relatively new. Did John do that? And, um, but relearned, e-portfolios have been around for a long time, and we've been a pioneer, I think, in, at Penn State in being a kind of international leader in the use of e-portfolios. This goes back maybe 12, 15 years ago. And uh, so now we're kind of reinvigorating that emphasis and how we can use portfolios as a way to understand student growth and development and perhaps allow students to be more self-directed. So another hallmark of our program is reflective practice. So John's asked me, I, I was a student in the higher education program 25 years ago and then I was a practitioner for uh, 25 years. Now I'm coming back to the program. So the model here in terms of innovation um, is, is clearly, you know, you need to have faculty excitement and administrative enthusiasm. And I think that's, that's really why I'm here. John Cheslock was uh, the faculty champion, I think, for innovation in our program, generated a lot of excitement uh, in the part of the college and our dean, and then the dean partnered with World Campus to support this initiative to create an online uh, master's program in higher education to build on an existing certificate program in institutional research, which had had great success in John continued that uh, before we initiated the master's program. So I think for, you, know, you need leadership and you need focus energy and a catalyst for change uh, would be my reflection on that. And then uh, John, I think some of the challenges to get that started, um, yeah, if we can move to the next slide there. Clearly uh, time and um, is a very precious resource as we know, so how can you carve out time from your week to focus on this, or have staff who then focus on asking this why question. Why are we continuing to offer this master's degree in the same way we've always offered it? Is it a time for maybe a paradigm shift and a new way of delivering the curriculum? But then how do we capitalize on the great assets that we have with the research that's going on in the Center for the Study of Higher Education and these great, what I would call, threshold performers? Uh, how do we capture that threshold performance that happens in residential instruction and make it as exciting and engaging for students online. So that's the challenge for our instructional designers and, and certainly myself, thinking about the teaching and learning process online. And uh, yeah, I think it requires multiple parties innovation, so you can't just do it within a uh, specific program. And we've been, I think, very proactive in reaching out to other units to see if we can develop win-win partnerships. So if we create a course, in academic advising, as an example, which we want to do because there's a great need and market for academic advisors, both residentially and online. Can we create that course in a way that it could be unbundled so that that could be used for professional development, not only at Penn State, but perhaps by other professional associations as well in this open environment? And could we establish micro-credentials for that particular uh, area of expertise? And could those micro-credentials then be uh, bundled in a portfolio presentation that would lead towards a degree? Or could we give credit for those unbundled micro-credentials in a way that would provide credit for prior learning that would count towards a degree and that culminating uh, aspect? So again, I think uh, we go to the next slide to maybe innovation is difficult to sustain. 
And uh, these are some of the strategies that we've used. Um, we talked some about uh, badges, you know, excitement, you know, and I think that to some extent is what happened with the portfolio. A lot of excitement about that, some initial funding, some champions who continue to work at Penn State today. Glenn Johnson's here today. You can talk to him about his early work with e-portfolios. But how do you sustain that innovation and take it to the next level? And if there isn't structure and there aren't staff to sustain that, then it probably isn't going to happen. So you need that ongoing leadership and uh, champion for that change. And then I think e-portfolios, the, the concrete and sustainable steps that instructors need to make to integrate that into the curriculum. So it has to be a curricular initiative, not just something that happens outside of the curriculum. So that's what we're trying to engage our faculty. And the way our strategy for doing that really is to engage them in online learning in a very meaningful way. <clears throat> so John's uh, vision was, let's have our signature course be one that's done collaboratively. And if you talk to most people, that, you know, that takes some doing. We've got a paradigm here of single author and a course that's developed, usually taught by that author or other people that we develop to teach that course, not multiple authors of a single course. But I think it's a brilliant strategy because then it engages faculty and they understand how to translate their resident instruction to online, how to become very skilled at doing that. And then they can develop their own course after they just kind of step through put their toe in the water and understand what it's all about, then they become expert and can develop their own course. Uh, so we've only asked them to develop the lesson in their area of expertise. We're right in the middle of that process of putting that course together. But I think that would be, again, another diffusion of innovation strategy. So we have faculty now all engaged in online learning, or at the very least understanding the significance of it as a future trend, and how can we then continue to evaluate uh, teaching effectiveness. So I think we want to end there and open it up for questions. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's a time for um, challenge uh, and uh, innovation. We're all in the middle of strategic planning. We've got this wonderful goal of 45,000 students with World Campus uh, and a provost that's really doing a wonderful job uh, of leading that planning process. So if you haven't heard his presentation, I encourage you, it'll be online to uh, listen to it. Uh, we teach the planning course. Uh, he's probably the best leader I've seen at engaging people in that conversation in a meaningful way. And I think there's a serious effort now to rethink where we're going as a university. And two of the pillars are transforming education and building our digital future and our infrastructure. So we all be right in the middle of that process. So that would be one one way to provide some structure to it and develop additional strategies. So John, I'll let you wrap up with other strategies for innovation and Well, I think, I, you know, uh, I think this is a good time to stop here and you hit that. So I don't know if the timing associated with it when the next sessions are. I think I'm happy to stay for questions. Yeah, we have time for a couple questions. If anyone has questions. Minds have been blown. <laughs> <laughs> so no, we covered a lot. I'll jump in. I hope. But this is you talk about a lot of research. But are there any actually implementation plans at the university for using badges and some of these looking at MOOCs in different ways? I know a lot of people are asking the same question. Of why to delete and start to implement some of these things at some point? Do we have any steps? Sure. So uh, within TLT, we've been developing a, a badging platform that I know we've talked a little bit about, uh, also in conjunction with COIL. And I think the initial plan as far as implementation is to try and tie that with the e-portfolio system. As Fred okay. mentioned, I think there's a lot of synergy there. Uh, you know, I think long term, we'd love to have a system that was interconnected to things like Angel and things like that, but that's a much longer term. Uh, view. I think a lot of it will also depend on you know what ends up happening with our future CMS because Blackboard, for example, is integrating tools like like, like uh, badges now. So it could be that there is, is easier pathways uh, than we expect there to be as we look at the, uh, the landscape at this moment. You need a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a few. Yeah, that's, if you build it, it doesn't mean they will come. Right? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So the the adoption and kind of the sustaining of, of those systems is the people challenge that. Yeah. Well, we'll you know, there, there's times in our, our conversations where we talked about, you know, there are 14 lessons or 14 weeks of this class, why don't we just create 14 badges associated with this? And then, you know, you develop the 14 as you get it, the class can be broken out, 
And you know, there's a I forget the university that implemented something like that. I think it was someone in the UC system. We we had a Chronicle article on that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, but you know, this goes to the sort of the time and attention challenge. And so we ended up saying, let's pick out a few very specific things that we can accomplish. Right? Let's make take two. You know, let's, let's make one one to two badges out of this course. Let's do that. Let's try to implement that. Let's figure out how that can then be linked into the ePortfolio. And then the ePortfolio also provides a space for a student to bring in other badges outside of Penn State. So now all of a sudden you're picking up more of the lifelong learning, not just this. And the idea of trying to just get some small wins that actually will be sustained as opposed to dreaming uh, in a way that just leaves us all very exhausted when we think about when we look at the notes from our meeting. Uh, this notion of students being self-directed you, you can develop a learning portfolio that only stays with the program. I think we want to encourage students to develop a career portfolio that they take with them and continue to develop for lifelong learning. So if we engage them in self-directed learning, they will continue to add to that portfolio, continue to add to their badge uh, list. And so there'll be both you know, required badges and optional badges depending on the student's interest. So that's kind of our thinking, but it's a fundamental shift in the curriculum. And I think until you integrate that into the curriculum, in my judgment, low probability of success. If it's just out there for people to take advantage of. And that was the lesson with ePortfolio. If it was just out there for students to create, we had the infrastructure, students wouldn't do it. But if it became part of their program of study and they had to do it to meet the requirements, then it got done. All right, I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, let's give a hand to John and Fred and the great work.